Okay, students, uh, we're going to have a revision video on uh, Elegy to His Mistress Going by, to Bed by John Donne. Uh, but before we do that, I've just got to say the most amazing thing has happened, right? The most amazing thing. Uh, you, if you watch this video, you can ask me about it, the details. But I was just in this room, 2.6, making this revision video. Um, I've got a little tripod, like, looking down at the, the thing, and I'm, I'm busy sort of talking, talking to the point. You can see I've already got a little way through it. And then I hear a knock on the window behind me, and um, there's some men... There's just sort of men who've been out on the roof. Now, bear in mind, we're on the second floor here. There's some men on the roof who have been painting outside and want back in. So I had to stop the video and just let men in through my window, which, you know, it was a bit like Romeo and Juliet in a lot of ways, you know. Um, right, so um, from that absolutely bizarre experience, back to a revision video on uh, To His Mistress Going to Bed. So... Let's see what I've written so far. So, uh, first thing to note is that it uses the word elegy. Now, that has sort of traditionally um, notions of uh, a lament for death or a sort of reflective and somber tone. Uh, this idea it links to Ovid, which is uh, quite sort of a, a sort of a, a serious. Um, an often quite aggressive tone in, in, um, in rhyming couplets. So you can see the use of couplets here. But this idea of it being sort of lamenting and, 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 and serious and mournful and reflective is sort of undone by Don. I think he's being a bit playful with it because it's actually what's known as a sort of a libertine poem. I mean, that, that idea that it's about, it's got sexual content and it's about sexual desire and it's about sexual liberty in a lot of ways, like, you know, being a sort of cosmopolitan person and, and, and you know, and, and, and jumping into bed with different people and things like that. So he's taken something that's got this sort of quite serious um, background effect, the idea of the elegy, and he's made it much more sort of ironic and playful and, and, and sort of sexually promiscuous, really. Okay. Um, and one of the ideas that uh, comes through with that is, is also the idea of the, the blazon. Now, the blazon is sort of linked to this idea of this coat of arms. So it's sort of a medieval technique of creating a coat of arms. And in poetry, what it often means is creating a sort of emblem of a person or sort of create, creating something that sort of, sort of um, is emblematic of a person. And this um, poem... Uh, it's all about the woman's body, the female form. So the female form has been sort of uh, emblematic of her virtues and her sexual uh, desire and all these other things. It's probably late Elizabethan, so um, even though it's um, published, like most Dunn poems, after his death, 1631, uh, the conventions are in keeping with sort of the more early Dunn, late Elizabethan, late 16th century, um, or perhaps in 1612, something like that. Um, a form of a more sort of ironic, playful, and sort of sexually promiscuous language that we see in the early Dunn poems before his move into the more serious, meditative, um, and uh, sort of almost sort of tortured, uh, divine phase uh, with, with his poetry. Um, it also takes sort of Petrarchan conventions, not the Petrarchan sonnet, although there's some elements of that. It's more the Petrarchan conventions in general of the idea of unattainable or unrequited, the pain of love, the beautiful agony of, of love, I suppose. Okay, so, and I'm having tea this time around coffee. I've had too much coffee in this afternoon. All right. So very quickly we can see that it is in rhyming couplets, okay? Defy, lie, sight, fright. So that adds a sort of a simplicity and approachableness to the language. It eyes, uh, and we can see as well that quite a lot of the, um, the language is sort of like colloquial or at the very least uh, conversational in its nature. And once again, very much like lots and lots of done poetry, we see come, madam, come, or the rest of my powers defy this idea of the, the, the passive female recipient, the idea of, um, I mean, say participant in, in some of these videos. I think you, you could say that, but they don't really partake, do they? So it's more like a, a recipient, if you like. Um, okay, so, come, come, madam, come, all my, um, I'll, I'll rest my powers defy, until I labour, I in labour lie. The foe oft times, having the foe in sight, is tired with standing, though he never fires. So it starts with this sort of metaphor of... Um, sort of an a, a, a army, sort of the foe oft times having the foe in sight, is tired with standing though he never fight. So there's a bit of a sort of a sexual euphemism going on here, that he's standing but never getting to fight, that, you know, he's, he's um, uh, at attention, as it were, uh, but not getting to... Uh, uh, to, to enjoy the woman's body. And this is quite a nice sort of play with words. Um, I think the technical term is antanaclasis, but don't, don't quote me on that. It's where you use the same word. It's a form of pun, essentially. The same word with different meanings. Okay, so until I labour, so until I have activity, I in labour lie. So like being in labour before um, uh, giving birth. So there's a sort of a clever, witty uh, punning 
that's going on in the in the poetry. It's very very similar to a lot of the witty, ironic, playful language that's used in the more sexually uh, promiscuous poetry, the libertine poetry that we see with Dunn. Okay. Uh, and then essentially what we get is a really, really good, uh, sort of really good, <laughs> it depends on your perspective, doesn't it? So sort of a really, really interesting focus on the female body. Much of the, the sort of the energy in the poem is focused on um, the female body and, and imagery, uh, uh, essentially sort of uh, displaying and, and, and worshipping almost that, that female body. And that's why I would say it's, it's linked to this idea of the blaze on like this idea, of this emblem of her, her body in some way or, um, or building up or idolising her in some way. Okay, off with that girdle, so a little imperative there, off with that girdle like heaven's gl zone glistening, nice little simile. Um, but a far fairer world encompassing, unpin that spangled bow again, imperative, spangled breastplate, which you wear, that the eyes of busy fools may be stopped there. Unlace yourself again, yeah, imperative, for that harmonious chime tells me from you that it is now bedtime. So you look at the, again, the sort of conversational, colloquial, down to earth, low register, playful language that's going on. And contrasting that, we see these similes of, of um, the sort of her transcendent beauty. This idea of her body, um, transcendent beauty, if you can see that. Um, her body is this, um, this site of absolute idolization. Um, okay, and it continues. Uh, where am I? Uh, off with the happy busk again, imperative. Off with the happy busk, which I envy, that still can be and still can stand so nigh. Your gown going off. Look at the change there to continuous form with the, the verb there. Uh, continuous tense. Uh, yeah, it's an ING participle, isn't it? So you're going, going off like it's bringing us into the moment, this moment now. Such beauteous state reveals, such beauteous state reveals, a little bit of sibilance in there. This idea, this, this tenor of uh, something um, uh, exotic or something um, uh, sort of uh, almost like a seduction, really, as when from flowery mead to the hill shadow stills. So it's a similar technique right the way through. It's sort of a little imperative conversational tone and then big simile um, li linking to a big idea, a sort of a metaphor for her body. As when from flowery means the, the, the hill shadow steals, off with that wiry coronet, again imperative, with that and sh shoe the hairy diadem which on you doth grow. Now off with those shoes and then safely tread in this lug's hallowed temple, this soft bed. So again this big contrast between the quite base sort of sexualized bodily imagery and this sort of uh, eternal transcendent view um, of her body, you know, this sort of uh, almost religious connotations, hallowed temple, so this I, uh, um, idolization, blah, 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 idolization, <laughs> I can't spell, idolization and idealization of her form, making her to the ideal woman, putting her as an idol or something to be worshipped. Da, 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 in, and, and look at this, uh, this soft bed, look at the DXs there, this one here, like they're in, in the moment, you know, this idea that in this moment right now, it's very um, uh, transient in its, in its focus. In such white robes, heaven's angels used to be received by men. Thou angel brings with thee a heaven like Muhammad's paradise. And though ill spirits walk in white, we easily know by this these angels from an evil sprite, those set our hairs, but these are flesh upright. So... Again, the sort of playful, euphemistic language, you know, flesh upright. I'm sure you can imagine, and so it's on a postcard, please, uh, what he's talking about there, this euphemism, upright flesh. Um, and again, contrasted with um, sort of divine, beautiful, sort of transcendent language, heaven, angel, semantic field of, of religion, the afterlife, etc. Um, and then it's sort of, there's a sort of slight change involving himself, no, no longer just idolising the female form, but license my roving hands and let them go, before, behind, between, above, below, these constant list of sort of prepositions um, here. So weirdly prepositions, but more like sort of used almost like adverbs here, like, like the, the way in which the hands will be moving. Um, this long list is very unusual in poetry. And then we have a lovely conceit, the sort of metaphorical analogy, really, this conceit of, oh, my America. So you can do something with that to the new world. Um, don't just say things like, you know, in the 16th century, they just discovered America. Have a think about it. You know, what, what is America to a person at the end of the, the 16th century? Um, it's this idea of mysticism, isn't it? Mysticism is that idea of discovery but also colonialism and power. So ownership, 
of the female body. So it's worshipped and it's unique and it's wow, look at this incredible new land. But also there's a sense of ownership and power and, and planting a flag, as it were, owning the female body in some way. And look at the way it's used, my kingdom, safeliest when with one man manned. So this idea of monarchy and, and rule, you know, a kingdom is safest when it's with one man man, so when it's it's ruled over by one person. So you can link in the sort of contemporary the contemporaneous ideas of um of ownership, of of monarchy, of hierarchy, uh, into your reading of the poem here. Okay. I'll just switch this over. If it'll still work. Not that one, this one. Okay. So um extending that idea, let's just check, you can still see that. Okay, yeah, great, okay. So expanding this idea of um the body as a sort of analogous to um, uh, the Newfoundland of, of America. My mine of precious stones, my empery, how blessed I am in this in discovering thee. So this idea of a sort of discovery uh, linking to ownership in some way. But don't just do the sort of the, the one-sided um, a version of feminist analysis here because there's much more interesting things going on. It's not simply that, you know, he wants to own her like they're owning America at this time. Um, this word empery, this mine of precious stones, um, how blessed am I in discovering thee. So um, this idea that there's a sort of a, a power in the idealized female form that um, she's, she's this ex exotic and exquisite thing, not simply something to be owned, but something to be discovered and, and weirdly sort of worshipped and have duty towards. And it, it, it c continues later on. How blessed am I in, dis in this discovering thee? Look at the exclamatory there. Look at the, the, the joy that's being felt. In the poem, how blessed I am in this discovering thee. To enter in these bonds is to be set free. Then where my hand is set, my seal shall be. So you do have this strong sense of power and ownership which we can analyze from a feminist perspective, but you've also got the interesting historical um, ideas here. So um, this idea of, of, of being entered into bonds is to be set free. So the idea of, of, of liberty and freedom being found in sexual activity is one of the ideas. So it's a bit like weirdly sort of a bit like a hippie poem, but with some weird sexual possessive ideas in it as well. So it's quite interesting. And then this version of what we call the poetic apostrophe. Now, um, don't go, whole hog with that really. I mean, the, 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 the apostrophe is this idea in a poem at which point you, uh, you go, oh, you know, and there's usually a single word interjection like an oh or an ah, an exclamation. So it's a form of apostrophe, form of poetic apostrophe. And it's the idea that it's sort of like an expression of excitement or emotion that's, that's sort of breaking through the bounds of the poem really. All joys are due to thee, all souls and bodies, bodies and clothes must be. I told you it was about hippies, didn't I? Um, sorry, I'm, don't, don't say I'm being mean to hippies, okay, you can be, you know, anybody, anybody can be, you know, whatever they like. Um, but bodies and clothes must be um, to taste whole joys. So this idea of the state of nature is something that's interesting in the poem, that this idea that to return to a state of nature, and you could link that to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but of course it's a joke for him, isn't it? It's like, it's ironic and it's playful. Um, oh, close me today's whole joys. Gems which you women use at like Atlanta's balls cast in men's views, that when a fool's eye lighteth on a gem, his earthly soul may covet theirs, not them. Like pictures or like books gay covering. So look at all these similes that are being used here to say that like clothing or gems or decoration are a distraction from the realities of, of, of the body beneath or the, the, or the, 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 the realities of the, the form beneath, like pictures or like books gay coverings made for laymen are all women thus arrayed. So he's saying like other people judge books by their cover, you know. They themselves are mystic books which only we whom their imputed grace will dignify must see revealed. So that phrase of sort of a mystic book is this link to sort of occultism, but sort of like mysticism, really. This is idea that there's some, um, you know, like in the restricted section in Harry Potter, like there's this idea of power within uh, certain books, you know, the books inside them have this power and, and mysticism and strangeness. Um, and so that's what women uh, are like to him. So the, the gay coverings that, of the book are like the clothes, the distraction, but the real uh, awesomeness is inside, you know, inside the, the actual form of the, of the woman, which only we, whom their imputed grace will dignify, must see revealed. And look at that language, revealed. It's almost biblical in its language, isn't it? So it's, it really is this idea of discovery. The whole conceit of the poem really is about discovering a woman's body. 
then since I, that I may know, as liberally as to a wood midwife, a bit of a dodgy uh, uh, simile there, there's quite a lot of them in the poem, um, so to know someone as, as, as liberally as a mid midwife, if you get the reference, show thyself, cast all, yea, this light wind enhance, there is no penance due to innocence. So again, it's got to be playful and ironic, there's no way after he's done all of this, you know, full nakedness to get your kit off type of poem, that he really means innocence. So the sort of playful use of sort of um, biblical language really, uh, innocence, penance, Honestly, there's nothing wrong with being naked. It's natural, but of course, he's really sort of playfully and wittily um, engaging in sort of a, a sexual, um, uh, almost like a seduction, really, but in a sort of a, trying to be funny about it, really. And then, of course, we get this <laughs> weird little inversion at the end to teach thee, I am naked first, and that's got to be a joke, hasn't it? It's got to be um, ironic and playful in tone. You know, uh, to teach the I am naked first. So we realise that through the whole poem, he's, he's got no clothes on, which is really, I mean, it's funny as much as anything else. Uh, though it isn't funny, it's basically abuse. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's the idea of a playful poem that's sort of exploring these ideas of, 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 uh, of, of nature and the female body. And then he playfully undermines that with a bit of sort of what you call bathos. That's the form of comedy that he's using, sort of undercutting big ideas, you know, penitence and innocence. And then, oh, look, I've got no clothes on. Why then, what needs thou have more covering than a man? So, you know, co more covering than man is sort of a weird sort of sexual metaphor, really, isn't it, really? Sexual at the end. So it, it, it's, it's got sexual references, it's euphemism. It's, it's got sort of these high transcendent, sort of ideal, idealised visions of, of femininity, but the actual purpose of it is, is quite sort of based. So one of the things we can say about it, if I just go back to um, the, uh, the start of this, this idea of the, the, the idea of the elegy, it's taken that sort of reflective poem and it's made it much, much more um, aggressive, which is in keeping with some of the uh, Ovidian, or Ovid is another poet, um, the, the influence done uh, classical poet. So th this idea of, of Ovidian uh, uh, elements, which, which gives it a more sort of sexually aggressive, uh, sometimes a bit disturbing elements. Um, and it sort of undoes the seriousness of the, the lamenting, the reflection. And fundamentally, it makes it more of a libertine or sexually liberal sort of poem. Um, be careful how, you, how you're dealing with that. I think it, it is possible to say that, you know, one of the reasons why it wasn't published in the original collections of, of Dunn Poetry is it would have been seen as, uh, you know, pretty outrageous, really. But, but don't let it simply be, like, back then nobody had any sex, so therefore they couldn't read it. But tr try and be sort of subtle with it. Try and think, like, um, it, it did undermine certain um, uh, ideas about sexual activity. It was... It would have been seen as, um, uh, as as very very challenging in terms of uh, its, its views, but it's not unheard of. There were poetry, there were poems like this doing the rounds in the, in the Renaissance. There's lots and lots of poetry that you would find sort of scandalous that is is, is common in the 16th and particularly 17th centuries. Um, so don't let it be simply that in the past it was all stuck up. That's not really how it works, but it does. Um, wittily through wit and ironicness and, and irony and playfulness ironicness that's not a word is it irony and playfulness it sort of um challenges a lot of the um uh, concepts of morality at the time but then also it does actually reinforce some very patriarchal views of women as as um both things to be worshipped and idolised, but also things to be owned and possessed, which is where the analogy with uh, colonialism comes in. Um, it, I really recommend you think about this one as a, as a connection. There's so many other poems that you could link it to, especially with representation of women, being clever with the use of irony, saying, you know, understanding that they, they didn't really mean everything, literally, that, that, that okay, metaphysical poetry deals with some enormous ideas. We've got references to angels and transcendent views of heaven and all the rest of it, but there's an ironic playfulness and wit in a lot of um, metaphysical poetry that, that it would be a good one to show I understand how that tone works really. Right, okay, thank you very much.